God gives Moses instructions for glory and for beauty. And Jesus faces Pilate, takes the place of Barabbas, is mocked, crucified, killed, and buried in a borrowed tomb. Today on 3 in 1, as we consider Exodus chapters 28 through 30 and Matthew chapter 27. For glory and for beauty, that caught my attention today in our reading. That phrase, it's found in verse 2 of Exodus chapter 28. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. I love that. God is the ultimate hopeful romantic and the ultimate artist, extremely concerned with aesthetics, with artistic expression and beauty. Have you realized that? If not, start looking around when you're outside. Sunsets and stars, seascapes and landscapes, mountains and valleys and fields and flowers, all uselessly beautiful if it were not for a God that was concerned about glory and beauty, for glory and for beauty. And we haven't even talked about the wood duck yet. (laughs) Have you ever seen a wood duck? I mean, God seriously spent his time painting that beautiful little creature. For extra credit, either now or afterwards, just Google a wood duck. Look at it. What evolutionary ability did all of that obviously intentional beauty give that little duck? None. All of those colors were given by God, by design, for glory and for beauty. God loves beauty. God loves artistic design. God loves for things to be intentionally beautiful, like the priestly garments. But we're also going to see this intentional beauty in all aspects of the tabernacle and its furnishings. We find that in verse 3 of chapter 28. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him that he may minister to me as priest. Gifted artisans filled with the spirit. Are you a gifted artisan filled with the spirit? Then honor God by creating, by making the most beautiful artistic expressions in whatever medium he has called you to, for the glory of God and for beauty. I love that. Now, I felt that I must mention again, even if it is only to remind myself, that I did not intend for 3-in-1 to be a running commentary as much as it is to be observations and an overview out of the overflow of my own time in the Word. Meaning, I have to resist the temptation to touch on everything and only focus on the particular things that minister to me the most each morning in my reading. Otherwise, we'd be here all day. And I've noticed that the episodes are getting a little longer than I had wanted, so let's dial it back a bit and behold the glory of God in a few observations from each chapter. Like God's intentionality in instructing Moses to enlist gifted artisans filled with the Spirit to construct and create each aspect of the tabernacle for glory and for beauty. Uh, A friend of mine reminded me this morning that this phrase filled with the Spirit as it concerns artistic expression occurs numerous times here in Exodus. Listen. Verse 3 of chapter 28 says, So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. Verse 3 of chapter 31 says, And I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works. Then there's verse 31 of chapter 35. And he has filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works. So be encouraged, artisans, craftsmen, tradesmen, architects, flooring installers, photographers, all who are called by God and filled with his spirit. God cares about glory and beauty. So honor him today by making something beautiful. I'm so blessed by this. Rediscovering this verse today for glory and for beauty. Okay, as you read through chapter 28, you will have noticed that each aspect of Aaron's garment was intentional, beautiful, and meaningful. And so was each aspect of his ordination ceremony, or rather his consecration ceremony. What does it mean to be wholly consecrated to God? It means simply to be specifically set apart for a good work. Aaron and his sons were specifically set apart for the good work of representing the people to God and God to the people in and through all the aspects of worship in the tabernacle. So God designed a beautiful and meaningful ceremony for ordination, for consecration, in Exodus chapter 29. And as believers in Jesus, we have gone through a similar ceremony spiritually. Listen to all these similarities in the symbolism. They were clothed with rich garments, 
We have been clothed with Christ's righteousness. They were anointed with oil. We have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. Their consecration came by sacrifice. We were set apart by the sacrifice of Christ. They were set apart by blood, on their ear, on their thumb, and on their foot. We were set apart by blood, as a living sacrifice, having ears to hear, hands that work, and feet that walk for Him and for His glory. See, we willingly offer ourselves up, and He willingly sets us apart, wholly consecrated to Him. You have been ordained by Him to glorify Him in whatever He has put to your hand to do today. So as you hear from Him and work from Him and walk in Him today, honor Him today. Okay, on to chapter 30, where we see further instruction for the furnishings in the tabernacle. There's the altar of incense, symbolizing the prayers of the saints rising to God. There's the bronze laver, where Aaron and his sons would wash before serving God in the tabernacle. And then there's the anointing oil and the incense, as they were to be created aesthetically, artistically, beautiful, and pleasing as well. Specifically, according to the master artist formula, that specific formula that could not be used for anything else, it was set apart specifically for worship, the good work of worship. Why? Well, our sense of smell can bring back the strongest memories. And maybe God wanted to trigger the worship of God with intentionality and trigger it intensely with this incredible smell of the anointing oil and the incense every time anyone went even near to the tabernacle, that sweet-smelling aroma of worship. What's triggered for you when you walk into worship? I pray that it's the intense memories of just how good God has been to you. I pray that if it is memories of just how bad people have been to you, then those memories would fade and new memories would be made, the sweet memories of the goodness and grace of God, only made possible by Christ's sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, which we read about today in Matthew chapter 27. The chapter began with Jesus being given, being handed over to Pilate. Judas had betrayed him, had Jesus arrested, and now Jesus stands before Pilate. And Judas was drowning in worldly sorrow over what he had done, choosing to run away rather than repent. And ultimately, his despair led to his own death. Now listen, if you are drowning in sorrow over your sin, run, do not walk to Jesus. You know what I mean by that, right? Push pause and talk to him right now. Tell him, confess to him everything that's on your heart. Get it all out. Hide nothing. Be specific. And then ask him to forgive you. And he will. Even going one step further, he will cleanse you completely of every single sin that you will confess. Don't let worldly sorrow for sin drive you away from Jesus like it did for Judas. Run to Jesus. You will not make it on your own. The burden of sin is too difficult to bear. It will drive you crazy. It will drive you to despair. It will ultimately cost you your own life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So what are you waiting for? Run to him now. We'll be here when you get back. Okay, we're back. <laughs> we left off with Jesus standing before Pilate, silent, like a lamb led to the slaughter. And Pilate marveled at this man's silence. Now, why was he silent? And why did Pilate marvel? Well, people in this position are usually expected to be freaking out, justifying themselves and pleading for mercy. But not Jesus. Why? Because in the eyes of God, he was guilty. Guilty for every sinful thought, every sinful word, every sinful deed that I have ever done. See, he was standing there in my place about to pay my penalty. And so he did not plead for mercy because he intended to pay my penalty in full. But Pilate couldn't see all of that. All he could see was a seemingly innocent man that the jealous Jews wanted crucified and killed. Evidenced by the same crowd that shouted a few days ago, Hosanna, Hosanna, that were now shouting, crucify, crucify, leading up to these chilling verses, verses 24 through 26, where it says, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water, washed his own hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and our children. 
Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So innocent Jesus was led away to be crucified as a substitute for guilty Barabbas. Innocent Jesus was led away to be crucified as a substitute for guilty Dominic. But not before he was beaten and mocked, whipped and scourged severely, satanically. Satanically inspired men taking full advantage of this brief window of opportunity to do their worst to the sinless Son of God. Just imagine how severe that beating must have been. And Jesus could have ended it all at any moment. He could have ended them all at any moment with just a thought, but he didn't. He took my place and paid my penalty completely, all the way. He paid my penalty in full. The subject heading for the next section of scripture in my Bible says, the king on a cross. That gives me pause. Considering my king, the king, the king of kings on a cross, on a cruel, absolutely humiliating, horrifying, excruciating cross for me. In fact, the very word excruciating means literally from the cross the word to describe the highest and most horrifying level of pain is derived from the events that we read about today. Excruciating from the cross where the sinless Savior willingly laid his life down for you and for me, able to end it at any time, and yet he didn't. Why? Because he wanted to obey God. He wanted to honor his Father. And ultimately, he wanted to rescue, to save you, to save you from the same penalty. He died as a substitute for you. He died in your place. He died paying the penalty for your sin, for my sin, for the sin of every man and every woman, for all of time, past, present, and future. And he paid it in full. And all that's left now, if you are sorry for your sin, is for you to run to him, not away from him, and to confess to him that you are a sinner, that you realize that now, And that you also realize that he paid your penalty. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you of all sin. And he will give you rich robes of his righteousness. So that you can stand before God in a relationship with him. Seen by him now, no longer as guilty, but sinless and spotless forever. That is amazing grace.